Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Fear Street Part 3, 1666, released on Netflix in 2021. Part 3 concludes the Fear Street trilogy with what ends up being two movies in one. The first goes back to the 17th century to show the founding of Shadyside and Sunnyvale and the truth about Sarah Fear. This historical time jump is something the Fear Street books did as well, when they visited the Puritan Age in the spin-off series The Fear Street Saga. The second half of Part 3 returns turns us to 1994 to tie everything together and finish off the big story. And I've said it before, but I'll say it again, it really sticks the landing. Everything comes full circle, and the revelations are hella satisfying. I think the Fear Street films got better as they went on, and the 1666 segment is my favorite of the series. By going back to the beginning, we learn things that reframe everything we've seen in the later eras. It shows that sometimes our history is based on lies, for history is written by the winners to make themselves look good. Best of all is the segments pay off in terms of this trilogy's themes, like how being different can cause someone to be ostracized, and how those in power will sacrifice others if it means they get to stay in power. I also enjoy the depiction of youths having always been youths. They may wear cloaks and bonnets, and their drugs may be fermented fruit, but kids are always gonna find a way to have fun. We drank Applejack. We danced. We are young. That is not a crime! The problem comes from the way adults react to it. 1666 takes place in the settlement of Union, right before it split into Shadyside and Sunnyvale. We see the story of Sarah Fear, as played by Kiana Madera, who of course plays Dina in Fear Street's 1994 storyline. To be clear though, the character we watch here is Sarah Fear. There's no actual time travel, Dina's just seeing Sarah's story through her own eyes, a result of having reunified her bones at the end of Part 2. Other actors from Part 2, and especially Part 1, are also also here, all playing new characters who relate to their modern day counterparts. Sometimes, as with Benjamin Flores Jr. playing Sarah Fear's brother, the character is an ancestor in spirit only. Other times, like with Emily Rudd and Sadie Sink playing Abigail and Constance Berman, the characters are literal biological ancestors, in this case of Cindy and Ziggy Berman. To help sell the setting, they speak in an accent that doesn't work all the time. Shouldn't you be sleeping? Father wanted to prove. But I honestly didn't mind. You get used to it after a while. Part 3 was filmed in the middle of Fear Street's three and a half month production schedule, since it uses actors from both of the other installments. The actors from Part 1 filmed this after finishing their 1994 work, while the Part 2 cast filmed this before starting their 1978 stuff. Unlike Parts 1 and 2, 1666 doesn't really riff on a specific horror subgenre. Sure, it's similar to period horror, like The Witch or The Village, but co-writer and director Lee Janiak also drew in inspiration from Terrence Malick's The New World, and the story is largely in the vein of The Crucible, which shows how women were subjugated as witches due to superstition and sexism. Will this blast from the past set a new Fear Street record for kills, or were things not as bloody in ye olden times? Only one way to find out. Let's get to the kills. The movie begins with another recap. Thanks for keeping us current, Fear Street. Or, I guess we're in the past now. That's cool too. 1666 to be exact, like the Devil Man number. That's quite a time jump from the 20th century, and while this village probably isn't Robert Eggers accurate, it's close enough to buy into the setting. I think the handheld camera style they use for this installment helps, as does Marco Beltrami's colonial sounding score. <laughs> Part 3 tells us Sarah Fear's story using actors from parts 1 and 2, something anthology series like American Horror Story do, further blurring the classification of this trilogy. I still think miniseries is apt. Sarah and her friends are planning a party tonight and RSVP to each other using secret passphrases. A full moon rises before nightfall. A good night to enjoy the fruits of the land. Oh, I'm coming too. Yeah, Constance Berman didn't get the memo. Sarah's best friend, huge quotes on that word, is Hannah Miller, the daughter of Union's pastor Cyrus Miller. Does that name sound familiar? Maybe if you see it written down. Sarah and Hannah's relationship is the spine of 1666, just like Dina and Sam's was in 1994. But in part one, we saw them at their most toxic towards each other. Seeing them loving and flirty here makes for a much more enjoyable love story. Even if it's one Hannah's mother is suspicious and disappointed proving of. Between their friendship, quotes again, and all that speaking in code, you can already tell how Dina's gonna go from average town youth to witch of the week. Doesn't help that the town drunk Tommy hangs on to her saying shit like this. I see the darkness in you, girl. Go wash your hair, Tommy. Billy Loomis looking motherfucker. Lee Janiac was so impressed by actor McCabe Sly as he filmed his 1666 segment that she gave him a bigger part when they moved on to shoot 1978. The Nightwing Killer used to be masked very early 
1978. And then McCabe was just so amazing um, that I was like, why are we putting a mask on you 20 pages in? Let's like watch you be Tommy. Let's watch you become this awful monster and then we'll get to the mask at the end. And so that was really motivated by how amazing he was. Good call. I think everyone enjoyed seeing bagless Tommy Slater as part two's main villain. That night, Sarah conspires to go see the town's current witchy woman with Hannah and their friend Lizzie, the analog character to part one's Kate. This woman, the widow Mary, lives in a shack in the woods. <laughs> possibly in exile for falling in love with a native man. The Union youths occasionally visit her for ye olde medicine and ye olde drugs. Ye olde mmm. She's also got a neat collection of witchy literature. Literature? But that doesn't mean you should read from it aloud, Sarah. Be so Set. Man, why are these kids always reading spooky books? Things clearly evil. Look, that's some Antrim shit right there. The Widow appears, played by Jordana Spyro, who played Part 2's Nurse Mary Lane. I forgot to mention it, but she also appeared in Part 1, showing us that Nurse Lane is still alive in 1994. The Widow is analogous to Nurse Lane's role as a blade-happy doomsayer, and she tells Sarah Fear that the devil's gonna get her. Damn, lady, these kids just wanted some drugs. Looks like they were able to procure them anyway, and the youths take turns dosing themselves with berries around the fire. Whoa, man, you feeling this shit? Looks like I'm in an industrial music video. I like that they get high off of actual blueberries here, since that was a nickname Kate used for the drug she was peddling in 1994. Blueberries and bananas? I get in on Percocet. Sarah and Hannah start eyeing each other, but an oafish lad named Caleb is interested too. He's played by Jeremy Ford, who was Sam's Sunnyvale boyfriend, Peter. Sarah comes to Hannah's rescue with a slap and a stock sound effect <laughs> and makes fun of Caleb's boner right in front of everyone else. Haha, <laughs> look, he's got a boner. Drugged up and horny, Sarah and Hannah tee hee into the woods and finally begin to act upon their long suppressed latent feelings. This is wrong. This is the first time these two have done something like this, and again, the beginning of this relationship is so much better to watch than the end. Tell me to stop and I shall. No, by all means, please proceed. Normalize all of this. Just keep in mind how dangerous it'd be if anyone else saw you. Ah, shit, someone saw you. They'll hang us, Sarah. Yep, that's how dangerous it is. So maybe don't tonsil box while that drunk douche Tommy's watching. The next morning, Hannah's got a problem. Her dad's a human fly farm who keeps muttering to himself at the altar. Ah, oh, man, and is he hearing voices whisper his name? Yep, that can't be good. We all know what flies and whisper voices lead to in this series. Hannah's worried that their lesbian dalliance may have caused this sudden sickness. And in any case, her mom ain't happy about their so-called friendship. Not one bit. Damn, lady. Goody Miller tosses Sarah Fear out of her house into a crowd of Union citizens who have already heard about her and Hannah. Drunk Tommy's been spreading it around, and at this point, even Sarah's dad knows. He blames himself for not raising her properly after her mother died. You were raised like a boy. I gave you too much freedom. The whole Fear household is falling apart, in fact. There are bugs in their food and their livestock's eating their own young, as discovered by Sarah's little brother, Henry. Whatever's plaguing their home is also spreading to Union at large, as the town suffers from bad food and wild horses. And a poisoned water well. <gasps> With Sarah's little dead dog, Maribel, oh no! Drunk Tommy proselytizes that this is the devil's doing, and his words strike home with citizens such as Elijah Good, played by Matthew Zuck, who's Mayor Will Good in the 1994 storyline. If there's one good boy around, you know he's got a brother. And Elijah Good's brother is Solomon Good, played by Ashley Zuckerman, who's Sheriff Nick Good in 1994. Sarah is one of the few people in town who looks after Solomon, who moved outside the settlement after his child and wife died. Though Sarah's dad wants her to marry Solomon, she thinks of him as a friend, a close friend she can confide in. She admits that she's afraid she did cause the town's new hardships because of her and Hannah's wicked sapphic love. Maybe the devil is in me. Solomon sincerely consoles her, saying that even if she loves another woman, she's still a good person. So there's no way Satan's got a hold on her. You've got to invite that evil bastard in. Regardless of who's been causing it, the evil in Union continues to spread. Hannah's dad, Pastor Cyrus Miller, locks himself inside the church with a bunch of the town's kids. The door is busted open by Caleb and the Good Brothers, uh, Solomon and Elijah, not Gallows and Anderson. And inside, Solomon finds quite the ghastly sight. At the altar, Pastor Miller mumbling to himself. And on the floor, a pile of greasy, grimy, I'm all. I can see everything. 
<laughs> yeah, something tells me you can't, brah. And neither can the 12 dead kids slumped over in these pews, including Constance Berman, the 1666 version of Ziggy, and Sarah's brother, Henry Fear. A later shot of their bodies confirms the count of 12 and calls back to a similar shot at the end of the Camp Nightwing massacre. Pastor Cyrus Miller comes after Sarah Fear, but Solomon Good saves her by stabbing the pastor with a pitchfork. With that, the town's first horrific tragedy concludes, but we all know it would be far from the last. The town blames the possession on witchcraft and has a meeting about it. Women in the back. Elijah, politician that he is, takes the stand and says someone has to pay. After all, they're probably being punished because of sinners in their midst. And I have a list of names! Oh, never want to hear that sentence said that way. Solomon tries to bring peace, but Caleb testifies that Hannah totally witched him the night of the party, brah. She, like, used witchcraft to give him that embarrassing boner, and then she and Sarah Fear got down and dirty with the devil. A cry of witches goes up, and the men of Union testify up and down against them two lesbian witches. And look, there they are now, lesbian witching up that window. In the chase that follows, Hannah Miller falls and gets captured, but she tells Sarah Fear to go on and get. Hannah is abused and embarrassed, and ultimately sentenced to hang, while the mob has a door kicking down search party looking for Sarah Fear. She manages to sneak around them and get into the church to talk to Hannah, where they realize there's nothing that they can do to make the town believe they're not witches. Everyone believes we've done it. So what difference does it make if we do know? Yeah, it's kind of like double jeopardy, so might as well make a real deal with the devil. No way that dude can be worse than the townspeople looking to hang them for their love. This is an awesome scene with a powerful performance by Kiana Madera. We've seen that so far, Sarah Fear isn't the legendary witch she's been made out to be, but this may be the moment where that all changes. They want a witch. Fuck yeah. Sarah goes back to the widow's shack, hoping that actual witchcraft might save Hannah. But the widow won't be able to help her with this plan, since Sarah finds her on the floor with her neck slit long dead. Sarah flees to Solomon's cabin and begs him for help. She says the widow's dead, and since the widow's devil book was open, someone in Union must have already made a deal with the devil. In exchange, perhaps for power? Hmm. Power, you say? Solomon says he believes her and hides her in his home when Caleb and the witch hunting party shows up. While hiding, Sarah finds an underground passageway that leads from Solomon's dwelling into a cave with a familiar symbol on the ground. The witch's mark. Oh shit, and there's the witch's book! And the witch's goat head? Aw, poor little bleedy guy. Yep, Solomon Good want pants too! Er, power. Solomon Good want power. That's why he slipped the widow's neck and made a deal with the devil. And why centuries later, Sunnyvale High would have the devil as its master. Scott. Now, you, viewer, may have guessed that Solomon Good was the bad guy by now, but Sarah fears so stunned, she falls out of Dina mode for a bow. It's you. It was him! He's also the one who saw her and Hannah in the woods on his way to doing his devil thing. When he read from the widow's book, while wearing that stupid hood, it formed the witch's mark in the ground, created the tunnel system, and made the gross blobby heart of darkness that spits out copies of killers. Solomon says that after losing his family, he felt entitled to a bit of happiness. So what if he has to sell a soul to make it happen? Not his soul, though. Someone else's. Cyrus. Miller. As part of his deal with the devil, Solomon chooses someone to sacrifice. Their name gets written in the wall, they become possessed, and the good family goes on to prosper. Bing bang bam. One person every few years seems a small price to pay. He tells Sarah she shouldn't worry about those idiot townspeople because she's better than them. Just like he's better than them. And maybe they can be better than them together. They're like me. I am nothing. Oh, so that's a no on the proposal? Well, it wasn't a real one. More like a trial balloon, you know? Sarah runs away from Solomon in his stinky caves and nearly trips over the pulsating blobby heart of darkness. Careful there, Sarah. That's probably like your only set of clothes. Solomon catches up to her and screams that he loves her, but sends a bit of a mixed message when he, holy shit, cuts off her freaking hand! Just like Sarah Fear never actually made a deal with the devil, she also never cut off her own hand. It was always Solomon. Sarah fights to escape and kicks out the wooden floor above her in a manner very similar to Cindy Berman in the camp kitchen. She emerges above ground in the middle of the church, but she's unable to have a happy reunion with Hannah in the town square. 
I found the witch! Because that motherfucking Solomon Good sells her out. The spineless, self-serving son of a bitch. The town marches Sarah and Hannah out to the hanging tree and demands that they confess their sins of witchery. With one last look at her love, Sarah bears the burden on her own. I confess! She says she made a deal with the devil and bewitched Hannah to be her lover. This is how the legend of Sarah Fear got started. And it's a complete tearjerker as we watch her take the blame and brunt to save the love of her life. It was only me. It was always me. Solomon orders Hannah let go and moves in to enact Sarah's punishment. Though she is no real witch, she curses him anyway. The truth shall be your curse. It will follow you for eternity. I will shadow you forever. With that, Sarah Fear is hanged by her neck. The music swells, and we see the real Sarah Fear, played by Elizabeth Scopel, as she recites her curse to Solomon Good, promising the truth will come out eventually. Once again, Fear Street moves me to frickin' tears. It's a truly emotional moment. Sarah Fear's friends were unable to save her life, but they at least want to give her a proper burial after death. They take her body from beneath the hanging tree and leave behind the engraved rock that would later be found by the Berman sisters in 1978. They move Sarah's body and bury it in a spot that would eventually be a ditch on the side of a road, and and from that spot, red moss spreads, a symbol of Sarah's truth or something. Part of Sarah's pledge to Solomon was that she'd make sure the truth came out. That's why she appeared in visions to all the people who bled on her bones. Dina's the only one who got the whole story, though, since she's the one who put Sarah Skelly back together. Now Dina knows that the Good family is evil, which is gonna be tough to deal with when the current Good is frickin' Sheriff. Title card! Part 2! Yes, for the final 45 minutes of this trilogy, we're back in 1994. But now we know the whole story and know that the Goods are bad, so Sheriff Nick Good is promoted to Chief and antagonist instead of the mysterious figure on the edges of the story. As much as I love the 1666 segment, and as much as I didn't care for the first film, it's great to return to the movie's present to see the consequences of all the lurid history we've learned. Dina and Josh steal Sheriff Good's police car, haha, <laughs> get wrecked, and Dina gives her brother a recap of everything she learned from her blood bone trip. Throughout their town's history, the Good Men have named sacrificial shady siders who become possessed and killed, the latest two being Ryan Torres and Sam, both named by an adult Nick Good. The blood of their victims fills the devil's tum tum, and he rewards the Good family and their community with good times. We see another montage of shady side killers, but this time we see how each of them were named by various good boys. Or good men, not dogs. You know what I mean. I love how most of the goods we see are played by Ashley Zuckerman. That dude knows all about succession. Ted Sutherland still plays Nick Good from 78, who named Tommy Slater and got all those campers killed. What a dick. Speaking of the shady side killers, that blobby black brain is spitting out another round of them now. The so-called Heart of Darkness that sits below Shadyside Mall is the physical manifestation of the town's evil history. Inspired by the nasty organic elements of the Fly and the Alien series, production made a practical build of the heart to use on set. In post-production, though, this was one of the biggest jobs for the visual effects team headed by Paul Graff. Simulating liquid is never easy. I like how the killers are still mid-transformation as they spawn, and they don't finish completely forming until they're up and walking around. Dina and Josh get back to Ziggy Berman and tell her about Sheriff Good. Girl's shook when she finds out her camp crush is actually the cause of Shadyside's pain and suffering. The curse never came from Sarah Fear, it came from the Goods and their deal with the devil. To finally end the curse, since they can't kill the devil, we need to kill Nick Good. Ah, good parody joke, Dina, if the NSA happens to be listening. Josh takes Dina and Ziggy to someone who might be able to help them, Martin the Mall Janitor, who we've seen harassed by Sheriff Good. He gave Josh his business card in Fear Street Part 1 after the kid helped him out in the police station. Their proposal is straight to the point. Want to help us kill Sheriff Good? Let me get my coat. Again, parody! Any government listening? Martin doesn't think they're actually gonna kill the sheriff for realsies, and he doesn't know what they mean when they start talking about monsters. What's really going on here? It's weird to me that despite the confusion, he agreed to go to the mall and help them anyway, but I don't know, maybe he was just bored and going with the flow. Honestly, I'm just happy we're back at the Shadyside Mall. I love that Fear Street's grand finale happens in the same place the trilogy began. Malls are always great in horror movies, and this one's got fun colored lights thanks to that Spencer's like store. Not Hot Topic ask. I misspoke in the part one kill count. Martin is shown the possessed Sam and is all like, oh no, dog! He also finds proof that Sheriff Good has been framing him. In part one, we saw Good holding Martin in a jail cell on charges of spray painting them all. Now Martin learns that the paint was planted, which to be fair, Good already outright admitted. These are actually 
my cans. Good's been spray paying Sarah Fear graffiti, graffiti all over town to keep the story of her curse alive and ward off any suspicion towards his successful family's involvement. Man, that good guy is one bad guy. They might need a cheat code if they want to beat him in the end. Up, up. Down, down. Or we can just talk about kick-ass YouTube channels. That's cool too, Josh. Dina gives an inspirational speech to her brother and these two adults she's only recently met. She says they're gonna avenge the countless shady siders who have been sacrificed and killed in the name of good. They kick things off with one of those stupid hand slices and the offspring playing on the soundtrack. When it comes to the shady side monsters, they've gotta keep them separated. Their plan involves booby traps, super soakers, and Dina's blood mixed with glow-in-the-dark paint that makes it show up under black lights. Before the monsters can show up, the Sunnyvale police force does. Officer Kapinski finds Martin and Ziggy, who react to a cop pointing a gun at them in very different ways, no doubt owing to historical encounters. Before he can decide what to do, Kapinski gets stabbed in the back by Harry Rooker, the milkman killer. Another cop, Officer Cusio, joins him on the kill count when the milkman stabs him in the stomach. I guess the milkman killed those cops because they were somehow in his way. It's the kind of flexible rule that got Peter and the hospital staff killed in part one, and it allows our shady side heroes to avoid slaughtering as the killers follow Dina's blood trails single-mindedly. Four of the monsters are lured into various stores in the mall and are trapped inside with security gates by Ziggy, Martin, and Josh. But none of these undead goons are the true big bad of the series. That distinction lies with Sheriff Nick Good, who meets Ziggy Berman face-to-face -face in the shady side mall courtyard. Flashback memories are had aplenty, and Ziggy pushes past her summer camp romance to enact the revenge she always wanted to, a Carrie-style blood dump. That makes Nick a target for all the monsters now being freed, but the bastard grabs Ziggy and rubs all that monster juice on her, too. In the ensuing chaos, Sheriff Good gets away, and is followed by Dina as the others find safety behind the security gates. To deal with the monsters, they spray them down with the blood that drives them so crazy, setting off a very violent, very kick-ass free-for-all where it's every mob for itself. They tear each other to pieces, but since they're already dead and reconstituting themselves as we speak, I'm not putting any of them on the kill count. Dina tracks Nick through mall locations built over historic spots in town, and because of her extended Sarah Fear flashback, she knows this grate leads to the tunnel system formed by Solomon Good's deal with the devil. It's the same spot Sarah Fear once kicked out of that led into the church, and then that much later, Cindy Berman kicked out of to wind up in the Nightwing mess hall. Underground, Dina calls out for Nick Good, and he yells back that his family does deserves everything they have. Solomon earned it for them when he made this devil cave. While he goes on his entitlement rant, the previously tied up possessed Sam somehow escapes. She runs through the mall and hops down into the tunnel where she catches up with Dina and starts fighting her. At the same time, Josh fights another shady side monster, Ruby Lane, but since both siblings recite the Konami code as a personal mantra, they're able to win their respective fights. Though to be fair, Josh gets assistance from Ziggy Berman with a gun. Really glad Berman didn't Brita that up. Sheriff Good finds a weakened Dina by the goopy heart of darkness and beats her down while saying he's gonna frame her. Girl, he's gonna frame you so good. In an act of desperation, Dina presses Nick's hand to the organism, which gives him a mental montage of all of this trilogy's nasty kills. Once again, Seraphir's Cursing of Solomon plays in voiceover, as the shady side victims of all killers and eras pop up to torment Nick. The last is Seraphir, who stabs Nick good in the eye and kills him. Oh, actually, Dina did it. She stabbed the sheriff, but she didn't stab the deputy. The killing of Nick Nick Good finally ends the shady side curse and gets rid of the monsters once and for all. It also breaks Sam free of her possession, so good job, Dina. You saved your girlfriend and killed the bad guy. That's pretty dope. They watch as the sacrificial shady sider names are erased from the wall, and as the witch's mark unengraves itself from the cave floor. They find an exit leading to a fancy home that can only belong to Nick Good. Huh, shitty guy, but I kinda dig his house. Maybe not the ram decor, but I love a good family tree. Oh, I mean a well-made family tree. Not like the good you know what I mean. Dina and Sam emerge on a rich-looking street smack dab in Sunnyvale, where they're greeted with neighborly scorn and suspicion. Joke's on that guy, though, because he's killed in a sudden car accident with a garbage truck. Tragedy has finally arrived in Sunnyvale. The truth comes out about Nick Good's bullshit, and a bunch of little character beats are given closure. I like the part where Ziggy reunites with her summer camp pal, Nurse Lane. As another Pixies track plays, Dina and Sam pay respects to Sarah Fear, the first shady sider. Hey, Sam, what if we kiss over that weird red moss and also Sarah Fear's grave. The movie ends with the camera taking a trip to the Shady Side Mall. It goes through the floor grate and the extensive tunnel system to find the witch's book sitting at the altar, at least until an unknown person grabs it. Let's finish learning all the facts to the story and get to the numbers. But first, 
The widow Mary hooked me up with some primo blueberries. Let's see what happens here. Oh, whoa, pretty good stuff. We had 19 kills in Fear Street Part 3, the most of the entire trilogy. There were 10 male victims and 9 female victims, the only Fear Street movie with more dead dudes than ladies. With a runtime of 114 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 6 minutes flat. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Sarah Fear. Not because it was gory or anything, but because it was so epic and poignant. This is the moment the whole trilogy hangs on, literally, and boy did they nail it. Great work. No machete for lamest hmm. kill will go to Officers Kapinski and Kuzio, who were simply stabbed to death by the Milkman. And yet, Shiny Shady Cider will go to Harry Rooker, aka the Milkman who killed housewives in 1950. Milkman got a solid push in Part 278, and I'm glad to see him prove he's a main eventer with two kills here. I'm not alone in loving him either. A lot of the cast cited him as the scariest killer on set. You just seen him in real life, it'll, it'll, it'll change your whole life. You'd be in therapy with me. <laughs> and that's it. Fear Street Part 3, 1666, came out like its predecessors in July 2021 on Netflix. The trilogy was a resounding success, and while it takes a ton of people to pull off something like this, I've gotta commend Lee Janiak in particular for masterminding and spending two years working on this project. Congratulations to her, and I'm glad she's already talking about doing more with the series. We have ideas. We have ideas. <laughs> Until next time, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. On the next Kill Count. Hi, little meaties. It's me, James A. Janice. For shit. Oh, ignore the obvious difference. It's still the J-Man, okay? Ooh, this is cute. I like this. Well, I've got another Friday the 13th recount for you, but this one is new. A new beginning. Solid. We finally get away from Crystal Lake to watch an older Tommy Jarvis freak out and kick ass. <laughs> Around him are countless characters who are absolutely hilarious. I got a bomb on me. I swear to you. Intentionally and unintentionally. Damn enchiladas. And of course there's Jason, the real Jason. You know, just like me, the real James. <laughs> yes, I've got them all fooled. <laughs> This week, watch Friday the 13th, Part 5, A New Beginning, a once maligned oddity that has seen reappraisal in recent years. And on Friday, tune in for the informational Kill Count Recount, only on Dead Meat. It's showtime! Friday the 13th, A New Beginning can currently be watched on the pictured streaming platforms. Dead Meat always recommends you watch the movie for yourself before it's Kill Count. It's the only way to have your own properly informed opinion. Kill Counts are never meant to replace the experience of watching a film. Thanks a lot for watching this extra Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Jess Harper, Maya Azar, Carl Lombardi, Kyra L. Irvin, The Real Bog, and Michael Hernandez. Obviously, this series gave me some copyright claim issues, but I just wanted to finish it and be done with it, and, and now I am. Hopefully, hopefully there aren't any more issues. Going back to one Kill Count a week for a little bit, but you know in October, I'm always gonna do more. So just look forward to that and be good people.